Hello and welcome to our lecture on asthma and COPD pharmacology. Uh, we're going to go over a little bit of physiology of asthma and COPD and the medications available for symptom relief and we'll talk a little bit about smoking cessation as well. Let's talk about the physiology of asthma and COPD starting with asthma. Usually with asthma you have an antigen or an exposure that causes irritation. This could be pollen, cold, dust, or anything really. And this causes an infl inflammatory reaction in your bronchioles. More specifically, it's usually a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. This type 1 hypersensitivity reaction will cause a lot of swelling and constriction. And this increases the mucus buildup inside of your airway. This uh, this is usually designed to prevent the irritants from entering deeper into the lungs, but as you can imagine, this response can also make it harder for the air to get out. In addition, you get a lot of parasympathetic nervous system response, and inflammation can both cause excessive vasoconstriction, and that um, working together will cause a lot of problems with the air getting out. Now, talking about COPD, this is caused by more of a chronic inflammation, uh, rather than like airways, more of um, asthma is more acute and reversible. COPD is more chronic and non-reversible. And because of the chronic nation, um, nature of this, you tend to get more um, damage to the lower airways. That's uh, in the form of losing elasticity. So patients have to put more effort into getting air in and out. Imagine a rubber band that's just gotten way too loose, or a balloon like over here, it's just gotten way too loose. And it doesn't really, it can't really push the air out passively. So we actually have to push down on this balloon to get the air out. And so you would expect them to have trouble getting air in and out. They'd have barrel chests because it's just uh, hyperinflated, and they'd be losing a lot of weight because they're using a lot of energy. So uh, in addition to that, they're going to have a lot of. Um, airway mucus clogging and that increases the resistance so overall it's not a good uh, place to be so when the patient is trying to get air in and out the pressure from their chest wall collapses the airways completely now what I want you to try to imagine is that when your chest wall is pressing down over here it's also pressing down over here as well so in the end it actually makes it just as hard because while you're trying to push the air out here, there's also you're also causing a lot of resistance here to block it off. So that's why that's why they have a very hard time getting air out in COPD. The most important drugs that are used to treat asthma and COPD are going to be the beta agonists. Remember in the autonomic nervous system lecture, parasympathetic nervous system causes constriction of airways. Uh, so the best way to fight the parasympathetic nervous system is to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. And we do that through beta-2 agonists. And they function by stimulating the sympathetic nervous system in the airway. This tilts the physiology back in favor of the sympathetic nervous system, and it causes bronchorelaxation or bronchodilation. So it causes less resistance. The most uh, commonly used one is going to be albuterol. Remember, albuterol is going to be the short-acting version, and this is more for a rescue inhaler. That's just, just to keep you from going to the emergency room. So these are it's good for managing rare asthma attacks. If you have to use it every day, you probably need to try something else, like steroids. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, for the more longer-acting ones, it's going to be sal salmetrol and formaterol. So these are more long-acting and therefore more severe or chronic asthma. These are the, for the people who get asthma attacks almost on a daily basis. So the adverse effects, of course, is going to be sympathetic nervous system stimulation. So it'd be a, it should be intuitive that you may get a little bit of beta-1 uh, cross-reactivity and get palpitations and tachycardia. So I've showed you over here a very um, how an inhaler often looks. And I've showed you the process right here. A beta-2 agonist will go to the beta-2 receptor, which causes uh, GS stimulation that causes an increase in adenyl cyclase. And adenyl cyclase will cause an increase in cyclic AMP, which then activates protein kinase A. This inhibits the, ML, um, the myosin light chain kinase, and this causes smooth muscle relaxation. That's a little bit of physiology for you. All right, inhaled corticosteroids, they're very easy to identify because they tend to have S-O-N-E or just S-O-N in their name. So um, uh, fluticasone is the most commonly used, um, but you can, may also see budesonide on your test. 
uh, mechanism they work by inhibiting the NF kappa B gene. That means that you will no longer produce cytokines, and that means you will not have inflammation in your airways. So you don't produce the mucus and the restriction and the increase in resistance of your airways. You don't get any of that. And it's mostly used for chronic asthma management. You got to remember that it's usually a step up from um, when albuterol does not work alone. This is for patients with daily asthma attacks. It's going to be more important for your third year, but occasionally it does come up in first and second year as how to manage an asthma patient. So the adverse effects uh, is going to be oral thrush. So I think if you remember from your immunity lecture, it works by inhibiting the NF-kappa B, which then can prevent a lot of the cytokine production and prevent inflammation in your body, which can cause you to be very severely immunosuppressed. But because this is an inhaled corticosteroid, you would get immunosuppression in your airway. And that makes it um, possible for thrush to build up or yeast in, um, from your mouth and your, and your airway. And this is just treated by like prophylactically, just swish and swallow or swish and spit, just to make sure that the steroids doesn't stay in your oral cavity. Let's talk a little bit about muscarinic antagonists. They work by blocking the muscarinic receptors. If you remember what uh, muscarinic receptors are, they're just M1, M2, M3. But we're going to talk mostly about M1. So they block the muscarinic receptors, and that blocks the parasympathetic nervous system. So one way to treat asthma and COPD is by stimulating the sympathetic nervous system or by blocking the parasympathetic nervous system. And by blocking the parasympathetic nervous system, you block bronchoconstriction, and you prevent your airways from constricting and increasing the resistance. Uh, there are two that you really need to know about. It's going to be ipratropium, and that's going to be for short acting and then there's going to be teotropium i remember teotropium is going to be for time and they all both all have tropium in their name just to remind you that they are muscarinic antagonists usually muscarinic antagonists have a t-r-o-p in their name so the adverse effects are mostly non-existent i like there's not really very many adverse effects with these although they may ask you if someone is especially sensitive, you may have to just recite the, uh, the adverse effects of muscarinic antagonists, which is hot as a hair, red as a beet, dry as a bone, mad as a hatter, which just describes hyperthermia, flushing, uh, dry mouth, or just dry um, decreased secretions, and possible um, de dementia, not dementia, delirium in older patients. I've showed you a little bit of the physiology that antagonizes M1, it, which prevents the uh, activation of the, um, the G protein Q, which prevents uh, calcium buildup, and this prevents muscle contractions. Omaluzumab is a monoclonal antibody against the FCERI region of the IgE antibodies. So Whenever I look at omaluzumab, I see MAB, which is monoclonal antibodies, and LI, which tells me that it targets lymphocytes or the immune system, and the MA, which tells me that it targets mast cells. So they're used to reduce the amount of IgE in the body. So imagine if they target the FC or the F constant region um, of the epsilon, which is just the IgE uh, antibodies, it would reduce them inside of our serum. This prevents the FCERI region from binding onto the mast cells. If they can't bind onto the mast cells, um, they can't be cross-linked. You basically disarm the mast cells. The mast cells use these as a weapon. So whenever there's an allergen here, they can cross-link to antibodies, to IgE antibodies, and this causes the release of a lot of histamine and inflammatory, um, like, heparin or whatnot, which causes a lot of edema and inflammation. But because they don't have these antibodies attached, they cannot have this response, and so you don't get an allergic response. You don't get the release of histamine, and it prevents inflammation, and it prevents swelling from the heparin. So this is used for allergic asthma. This is important for you to know that it's only it can only be used for allergic asthma when steroids are not um, are not working and beta-2 agonists don't work alone. It would not work on exercise-induced asthma. That's from cold irritation. It can only be used if there is an actual allergen involved. So again, here's just how you memorize it. OMA just for mast, LI for immunogenic, and MAB for monoclonal antibody. Chromalin, it's a 
less used one if you're interested in immunology and allergy medicine, which is a fellowship after internal medicine, you're, you're probably going to be seeing this a lot more. It's not fully understood, but it's believed to stabilize the mast cells and it prevents degranulation. So we don't really understand how, but we know that the chromolin just goes into the membranes and it just stabilizes the membranes. And the stabilization of the membranes makes it so that mast cells cannot degranulate as easily and it cannot release pro-inflammatory mediators. So it just prevents the release of histamine, leukotriene, and inflammatory factors. All right, let's talk about leukotriene inhibitors. What you need to know is that there are two ways that you can target uh, leukotriene inflammation, which is mostly in the inflammation inside of the lungs. That's where you're most often tested when it comes to leukotrienes. So uh, you can either target the receptors over here, uh, or you could target the 5 lipoxygenase over here. Let's talk about the receptors. They all end in Lucast, like Montelukast or Zephyr Lucast. And just remember that as Lucast, I just try to remember Lu being leukotriene and Cast just being the receptor. Now, uh, they block that receptor. They may not say leukotriene receptor. They may say cyst LT1. Just remember, LT1 just means leukotriene. So don't get, don't get too confused there. Xyluton works higher up in the pathway by inhibiting the 5 lipoxygenase pathway, and that prevents the production of leukotriene from arachidonic acid. Now, when is this the best time to use it? If they tell you that the patient has been using aspirin, and whenever they use aspirin, they get asthma attacks, then you want to use these leukotriene inhibitors. And the way that works is that if you're using aspirin, you're blocking the COX pathway, and if you block the COX pathway, all the arachidonic acid wants to go to leukotrienes instead. What are you going to do with all of these arachidonic acid pathway? So you probably have to block this pathway as well to prevent asthma um, caused by aspirin. But this is a really rare side effect either way. All right, let's talk about methylxanthines. You really only need to know theophylline, which is the most important one over here. And it's very similar effect to caffeine but it has an opposite effect to adenosine. Let's talk about what your body normally does. Usually you have a sympathetic nervous system reaction, which causes an increase in cyclic AMP. This lets your cells know to be to have more that you have more energy in terms of your airways though it means to be more dilated just lets more air come in so this is just letting your body know that it's got a lot of energy but your body also wants to let you know when you're tired and that's um, the role of phosphodiesterase it'll break down the cyclic amp and turn it into adenosine adenosine will trigger some receptors adenosine receptors and it'll slow it down you should remember in your cardiology module that adenosine can be used to stop certain arrhythmias by just pretty much shutting down the heart. It's like your heart stops for a few seconds when you give them an injection of adenosine. It's actually quite scary. But that's exactly what we want in this case in the lungs. It triggers those adenosine receptors in the lungs, which then it stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. Instead of stopping your heart, it actually constricts your lungs. So that's not really what you want there. Uh, you want the opposite of that. We want the lungs to expand. So here's so what theophylline does is it inhibits the um, adenosine production, or it inhibits the cyclic a AMP breakdown. So you get a lot. Um, you inhibit this, uh, the adenosine production, and that prevents the sympathetic nervous, the parasympathetic nervous system stimulation. But you also get a buildup of cyclic AMP right over here. You get a buildup right there uh, due to the phosphodiesterase inhibition. And that causes a more sympathetic nervous system response, and you get dilation. Now, you can um, see over here, caffeine works a little bit later by just inhibiting the adenosine receptor. So caffeine doesn't really give you more energy. It just prevents you from feeling tired, I guess is how you would describe it. Uh, now, the adverse effects of methylxanthine is going to be very similar to just overstimulation. It's going to overstimulate your heart, so you get cardiotoxicity, and it'll overstimulate your sympathetic nervous system and put you at risk for seizures. Uh, something that you need to be careful is that um, blocking P450 system, the liver enzymes, can cause an increase in concentration, and that can put you at risk of seizure and cardiotoxicity. Let's talk about smoking cessation. The first drug that you need to know is going to be verniclene. Verniclene has a nick in its name. That reminds me that it is a nicotinic acetylcholine partial agonist. And I need you to remember the phrase 
an agonist in the presence of a partial agonist is an antagonist. So this pretty much means that if someone takes vernicline and is also smoking at the same time, it's going to make smoking pretty unbearable. It actually makes it feel worse because a partial agonist will actually turn the agonist into an antagonist when they're both present inside of the patient's bloodstream. However, if the patient takes vernicline alone, he'll actually get a small amount of dopamine release. So it's, it kind of encourages them just to take vernicline and not to smoke at the same time. The side effect is going to be poor sleep, um, and that may just also be associated with just quitting smoking in general, so it's nothing new. But it was used to be believed that it causes depression and suicide. That's no longer the case. A new study in 2014, 2015, they've both proven that um, it does not cause depression or suicide risk in patients. Uh, moving on to Bupropion. Bupropion inhibits the norepinephrine and dopamine re reuptake in inhibition. So what that means is that it causes norepinephrine and dopamine to last longer in the synapse. If dopamine is released here, it prevents the reuptake, so it lasts longer in the synapse, and that's the same thing for norepinephrine. It prevents the reuptake of norepinephrine, so it, it increases the amount in the synapses. So what is that used for? If you have a lot of dopamine in your and your synapses, that makes you feel good. So that's actually the first reason that we use bupropion. It actually causes them to feel really good and it causes, an, um, and it's used as a treatment for depression. Uh, however, uh, we don't know exactly why, but it actually works really well in making patients no longer interested in smoking. They just don't have the urge to smoke when they're on bupropion. So it can often be used for patients who are smokers as well. If they if they mention a patient who is depressed and is trying to quit smoking, this is the drug that they're trying to get out of you. Another reason that they, you may want to use uh, bupropion is that it does not have erectile dysfunction, so it is very good alternative to a lot of the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, to, and it's very useful for sexually active patients. It can, however, increase seizures. So if you have an increase in seizures, uh, you want to think of the patients who are at most risk of that, and that's going to be the bulimics and the patients with electrolyte imbalance, maybe renal disease patients or something like that. So if they're at an increased risk of seizures, don't give them bupropion because that's just going to put them at higher risk. All right, how are you going to use this information? So I think if you learn the mechanism, the adverse effects should be pretty intuitive. For example, if you know albuterol and theophylline stimulate the adrenergic receptors, you would expect heart palpitations because that's also in the sympathetic nervous system. Iprotropium inhibiting the muscarinic receptors, inhibiting the parasympathetic nervous system, you would expect the, um, the adverse effects of that, like dry mouth. Uh, steroids, which inhibit the inflammation, you would expect an immunosuppression or a thrush inside of your mouth. So that should all be fairly intuitive right there. Use this as an opportunity to review the autonomic nervous system drugs and the immunologic drugs. Try to make connections on your as you go through medical school and it makes it so much easier because you need a bigger picture view of all of these drugs in order for you to succeed third year, fourth year, and beyond. As for third year, you need to know how to manage um, asthma. Sometimes they expect you to learn how to manage them as a first and second year student, but you definitely need to know before your pediatric rotation. So uh, usually we start off by short acting beta agonists like albuterol. If that doesn't work, we usually add inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, if that doesn't work, we'll usually switch the short acting to a long acting beta agonist. And if that doesn't work, we usually add a medium dosed uh, in, um, inhaled corticosteroids to the long-acting beta agonist. And if that doesn't work, we'll try the highest dose of inhaled corticosteroids, and we may even give them an oral corticosteroids, plus or minus that. All right, that's all you really need to know for uh, asthma and COPD, and good luck.